I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Naomi Hadi, who actually had pretty bad laryngitis this morning, but it's gotten better during the day. She was a little bit worried and had lots of tea and honey. Um, she's a professor of medicine at the Longer College of Medicine at UVM. And during her talk tonight, she promises to shed, this is a promise, she promises <laughs> to shed light on the pervasive culture of perfectionism among women and girls in America and its profound impact on neurobiology, emotional responses, and mental well-being. Drawing from her extensive experience as a physician and a professor of medicine at the Larner College, Dr. Hadi has observed firsthand the detrimental effects of perfectionism, particularly on young women and students of color in the medical field. Through her mentorship and coaching initiatives, she actively addresses and challenges the imposter syndrome and self-doubt that often hinder professional growth and success. She will share practical strategies and evidence-based techniques for overcoming limited, limiting beliefs and fostering self-compassion in all aspects of our lives. She, act, um, she can, uh, we can hope to gain some valuable insights into navigating the pressures of perfectionism and cult cultivating a confident and resilient mindset. She obtained her undergraduate degree from Middlebury College, yay! <laughs> um, her medical degree from Temple University and completed her internal medicine res residency at the University of Washington, Seattle. You were in good places. <laughs> um, and also, she has three boys. One is graduating from high school this year. Mm -hmm. She loves hockey, and you'll see evidence of it perhaps in her slideshow. And she lives in Cornwall. So she's among us, living among us, and we really appreciate that. So. Dr. Hani, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction and for inviting me to be here. I apologize uh, for my voice, but I think it's sounding better and better. So who knows by the end of tonight, it might be the best it's ever been, which is not what we're supposed to hope for. Um, not perfect, thank God. Thank God. Um, I uh, am, am really so honored to be here to talk about something that I am really passionate about, and um, I hope you all can learn something too. So I have no financial disclosures. Uh, I wish somebody would pay me to do this, but they don't. So um, we have to work with what we have. So I'm going to start with a story today, and the story is uh, of one of my medical students. Um, this is not actually a picture of her. But she goes, uh, she has the initials MZ. I've uh, hidden her name to protect her identity, but this is actually a true story. So this is a Cracker Jack medical student. She's just awesome. She is the class of 2025 at UVM Larner College of Medicine. Before that, she worked in a lab at Berkeley. She had several papers and a national presentation. She was summa cum laude from uh, the University of California at Berkeley. And before that, she was the valedictorian of her high school, not one of our rinky-dink high schools, a real public high school in California, the real deal. So this woman <laughs> is like all that in the kitchen sink. She's so awesome. And she's got all the credentials. And maybe what some of you might not know about, when, about me, because you heard some things about me, but I'm a, I'm a physician and I'm a hospitalist and I work with patients who are admitted in the hospital at UVM Medical Center and sometimes at Porter too, but I'm also faculty. And so I supervise our students when they're learning on the wards. And the way they learn is by, <clears throat> is by taking care of patients, excuse me. And so we help them learn how to take care of patients. And then at the end of the time that we work with them, we sit down always and we give them feedback. And the way that we do feedback in most of medicine and in a lot of other industries is the feedback sandwich, right? So we say a good thing, and then we say <clears throat> maybe some things for improvement, and then we end with a larger global view of how are you doing and where do you go next? And so I brought MZ into a quiet room, and we sat down for me to do her feedback from the rotation. And we sat down, and I always start with, how do you think it's going? What do you think is going well? And she sits there. And she starts looking at me, and her eyes are filling with tears, and they're like dribbling over the side and down the side of her face. 
and I'm a little confused because like I told you, she's amazing and she had a fabulous rotation with me. So <clears throat> I said, well, tell me more about what's going on. You think it's not going well in this rotation? And she said, no, I think it's actually going fine, but I'm really worried about how I'm going to tell my parents that I'm getting kicked out of medical school. And I said, well, that's not what I expected you to say. You really are one of the best, a really awesome student. So I said again, well, tell me more. And she said, well, this was a Friday, because uh, it was at the end of our week together. And she said, well, I got this email yesterday, and it was an invitation for a meeting from the dean's office. And it didn't have an agenda attached, but it was an invitation for a meeting, and they want me to come. So I accepted the meeting, but now I'm probably getting kicked out of medical school, and I'm going to have to tell my parents, and I don't know how to tell them. And, and I said, huh, OK, well, that is confusing when someone sends you a meeting invite and it doesn't have an agenda attached. Tell me more about why you think you might be getting kicked out of medical school. And she said, well, last month I was on a rotation, on a surgery rotation, and I really wanted to scrub in on this case. And so I went to the attending, the doctor who's supervising, and I said, can I scrub in on this case? And he said I could. But then it turned out there was this other student who also wanted to scrub in on the case, and he didn't get to scrub in on the case, and so I scrubbed in on the case, and then he reported me to the office, and now, you know, the rest is history, now I'm getting kicked out. And I said, okay. So we brainstormed, and we troubleshot, and we thought about what could MZ do to try to figure out what's really going on here, because I just had this nagging suspicion that probably she wasn't being kicked out of medical school. So she's, I said, well, why don't you email the admin, and maybe she could give you a little bit more of the agenda. And she said, okay, that's a good idea, I'll do that. And I said, you don't even have to talk to the dean, just talk to the admin, and she'll tell you. And so <clears throat> MZ emails them, and the follow-up from this student was that not only is she not getting kicked out of medical school, spoiler alert, not only is she not the worst, she's literally the best. She was being called into the dean's office so she could be asked to be on a panel to represent the Lerner College of Medicine because she's so fantastic, right? So it's kind of funny but kind of stressful for this woman and also where does she get these ideas where is this coming from in this woman's brain where is the first place that this woman's thoughts go that she is going to be found out that they're going to realize she's not the student that they thought she was she doesn't belong here and she should actually be kicked out of medical school so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today but as we think about being the best I want us also and we think about sandwiches I want us also to consider um, some records with sandwiches which we may not want to break. And that is the largest sandwich <laughs> that um, the Guinness Book of World Records largest sandwich uh, record was in, broken in 2023 by two Wisconsin brothers. This was 10 feet by 6 feet long. And sadly, I know you're going to be so sad, it broke the record which was previously held by Vermont and Cabot Creamery, the largest uh, sandwich ever made before this one in Wisconsin, uh, weighed 320 pounds. Wow. They make it on focaccia bread because they don't want it to be too brittle. You know, you really got to hold its, its structure. So there are some things in which we may not want to be the best and some sandwiches we may not want to talk about. So. Where does this medical student get this mindset? This is an, actually one of my real ma uh, medical students. And you can see that she is exuding this air of happiness and strength and positivity. But inside, she might be thinking just like MZ was. She might have catastrophic thinking. She might have a scarcity mindset where there's just not enough to go around. She might be telling herself um, harsh self-criticism and some negativity bias. Medical students, if you give them nine pieces of positive feedback and one piece of negative feedback, they will harp on that one piece. And I think we all do this same thing in this room. We don't have a, be a medical student to do this. We compare and we despair. We say, we're, I'm not as good as someone else. We hang on to perfectionism and we just will take it to the bank and we have this incredible imposter phenomenon. So, our culture of medicine is a setup for this. And actually, our culture in general is a setup for this. We expect our children and our students and, our, um, and everyone that works with us to be perfect 
and we send the message that if you're not perfect, then it's just not even worth doing. And you could say, and I would say too, that the problem here is not within these individual people, that they need to change or that we all need to change, that the problem is with our systems. <laughs> and that is absolutely true. But I will say to you that while we work to change these systems, we also might look within ourselves and see if we can find some way to make some of this better and easier to handle. So what is imposter phenomenon? We call it imposter phenomenon and not imposter syndrome because syndrome implies that it's a disease that somebody has within their selves, that something's wrong with them. But imposter phenomenon just means it's something that a lot of people are feeling. A lot of women, a lot of men are also experiencing this on a daily basis. This was a term that was coined in 1978 um, by two psychologists as an observation among successful women and also other marginalized groups. And it's this thought among high achieving individuals, this pervasive sense of self-doubt and combined with a fear of being exposed, that somebody is gonna figure it out and it's just the next time around the corner that somebody's gonna realize that you're not as great as they thought that you were. There is an established relationship between imposter phenomenon and other mental health issues, um, anxiety, and depression, and women in medicine specifically do exhibit this characteristic more than men. They exhibit it more when it's been studied as students, as residents and trainees, and as practicing uh, physicians. This is something that needs to be studied more. There's a lot more work to do on this, but many studies have shown this to be true. There's also this thought that men are having these same ideas, but they do not manifest them in the same way. But since we're here to build up women today, well, let's just stick with that one. So the other thing to think about is that other marginalized groups and un underrepresented people um, do experience this more. So there's an intersectionality between those who are underrepresented in, in all areas. So people of color who are also women and are also in medicine have the worst case of this. So why should we even care about this at all? You might say, aren't women really making a lot of strides in the medical profession? And I will tell you that if you said that to me, you would be right. Because more women apply to medical school and have higher matric matriculation rates in medical schools now uh, than men. And the tides are turning. And this actually mirrors a trend that we're seeing in higher education um, at all levels, that we're seeing more women than men. But what's interesting is when we look at after people get out of their training and they move into their careers and they move uh, through, um, through the, um, especially in academic medicine, they move through the ranks, that many fewer women achieve leadership positions than do men. And when you get to those highest leadership positions, such as CEOs, heads of departments, um, or other leaders, it is notable that um, in academic medicine, women only make up 18% of those. So they start out um, at, I believe it's at this point, 55% of the population graduating, and when they get to those higher ranks, uh, they're only at 18%. And so I do think this is something we need to be working on um, within uh, the medical culture and the medical profession. And these are some of the pictures of my residents and me, and we have a lot of fun when we do that. You can see on the lower right there, we had twinning day one day, uh, and it was my all-female team, and we rounded, and we wondered if everybody couldn't tell the difference between us, because we were all wearing the same outfit. And then up there in the top picture, that's another all-female team I had of my residents, and we had a, a waffle breakfast while I made waffles, while one of our medical students presented uh, a little talk to us, and we learned and we ate and it was a waffle lot of fun. <laughs> um, and then here's, a, actually this is on Christmas Day at the hospital just this past year. You can see that the majority of the people in this picture are women. We dressed up, uh, I work on the oncology floor. We try to make things uh, as positive and as upbeat as we can uh, for our patients. And uh, we just had an awesome day that, that, that day and we had a party. We invited everyone and we had cookies and we had hot chocolate and it was awesome. So 
I think we should be thinking about uh, imposter phenomenon and perfectionism uh, in women and how we talk to ourselves. But we should also be thinking about what messages are we sending to women and how we talk about them. And you might think again that we're all very aware of the language that we use around our students and our residents. Um, but you would be wrong if you thought that. So this is a study that was done and published in 2019 at UCSF School of Medicine. And it evaluated the language that was used in, um, in written reviews of medical students after they were on their rotations. And it evaluated um, the descriptors that were used for men versus women, or those who identify as men versus those who identify as women, and also underrepresented uh, minorities or underrepresented in medicine and those uh, within the mainstream groups. And if you look there, you'll see that female identifying students were often described with personal attributes, using words like lovely or cheerful when they were talking about them in their evaluation of their performance on their medical rotation. And men and male students uh, were described with relevant competencies to the work that they were doing and that we were evaluating on them, such as scientific, relevant, outstanding, um, all the words you might think we would want to hear if we were learning about a student who had really learned and grown. So language is important. What we say to ourselves is important, and what we say uh, to those around us is important, and we need to be aware of it. Um, this message of perfectionism. What is perfectionism anyway? Perfectionism doesn't mean you're perfect. Some people don't even identify as perfectionists because they realize, I'm not perfect, so how could I be a perfectionist? See, the idea of perfectionism is not that you're perfect that you think that just around the corner you will be perfect. Better is always better when you're a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, exemplified by rigidity, all or nothing, nothing thinking, negative self-talk, and this imposter phenomenon. Judgment and negativity bias, like I was telling you about. The fear of failure, unwilling to take a risk and try something in case it doesn't work out and you might be revealed to not be perfect. Focus on the destination rather than the journey, the process, uh, the product rather than the pro process, and thinking about external validation for how we achieve things. And we can think about this in several different ways in the growth mindset, but you might imagine in my favorite sport, you might think about the finite game versus the infinite game. And this is embodied by thinking about youth hockey versus pond hockey. So here, I, and, I, and I will qualify this by saying I do love youth hockey. And our youth hockey president um, of our organization is married to me and is here tonight. And I, will, I would never say a bad thing about structured sports in America as long as they are cultivating a growth mindset and learning and opportunity in our young people. And this is my son, Gus, who's actually sitting back there tonight with us serious look of determination on his face on the ice with a referee looking to win, always looking to win, and looking to improve. Um, and when he does, he has this amazing look of accomplishment when he wins the backward skating contest at the Rutland Christmas Jamboree for the under eight set. Um, so there we have this idea of working to achieve something for the glory of the win. But we can all appreciate the fact that most of us can work towards something. But in sports, most kids won't even get to play on their high school team, let alone on their college team or in the NHL or in a professional level. right? So we have to appreciate the value of working towards something just for the joy in doing it. And if you now look at my son's face there on the left, there is nothing better than pond hockey and a glazed donut with your best friends <laughs> at, their, at their pond in the winter. Absolutely nothing better. It's way better than winning that medal, I think. <laughs> and if you want to see an even better picture, you can see this was uh, taken after one of our big pond hockey games, multi-generational, all different kinds of people playing on the ice. And if you look at 
Gus's face right there. <laughs> sheer joy for the sheer love of the game She's and for the experience. So maybe when you're playing uh, pond hockey outside in the winter at your best friend's pond, you might have a fire and you might be thinking about making some s'mores. And there's another record that our state actually holds. And that is the largest <laughs> s'more in the world. And this is true. The largest s'more, 342 pounds, which was achieved by Planetary Matters in Middlesex, Vermont. <laughs> But I would ask you, I would ask you, is it always better to be s'more? <laughs> I think if we're going to understand being better and maybe cutting off some of these habits and um, attitudes that we have, we need to understand the brain just a little bit better so we can think about the lizard brain and the wizard brain. And that on the bottom there is Professor McGonagall, the best woman wizard that ever uh, was created by J.K. Rowling. So Neurobiology 101, we think about the wizard brain versus the lizard brain. Back in the day, way back in early humans, we needed to have some reflexes and some um, self-protective mechanisms that were on autopilot. And that's our lizard brain and our limbic system. So the amygdala is a, um, a structure within our limbic system which processes fear and threat and all kinds of negative emotions. And when we were back in the day about to be eaten by the saber-toothed tiger and we saw that coming at us, our amygdala would send that message to our sympathetic nervous system and increase our stress response. And then we could run away and we could survive and uh, procreate for the next generation. But some of those responses remain with us today. And a lot of what we um, experience when we're having negative emotions or fear is a throwback to those days when the amygdala was telling us uh, that we're going to die. And so this is what we call the amygdala hijack syndrome, where you're not really at risk of uh, being killed or dying when somebody realizes maybe that you're not perfect or that you've, um, you've done something uh, with a less than 100% uh, result, right? So, nonetheless, our brains like to tell us this. Our brains are using the information that they process to say, we're having threat right now, we better start the stress response. And this is an automatic response that does not come from the upper, um, higher levels of reasoning or the prefrontal cortex, which is the areas of intelligence and higher levels of thinking and understanding that make us what we are as humans. So what I would say is that when we experience those, uh, those fight or flight responses, it's without the use of our, of our higher functioning brain. And that path um, that goes from uh, the amygdala and into our stress response and then back again and back again when something that's happening to us is a perceived threat rather than a real threat, can be um, interrupted if we use our higher thinking and levels of our brain. And these things go both ways. So we can have thoughts which can regulate our emotions and our amygdala, and then uh, create our emotions and then create our actions, or they can go from something that's happening that's perceived as a threat that goes back up to our brain. But our thoughts, rather than our circumstances, are the root causes of our emotions in many cases. And so, thoughts cause our feelings. And feelings are the things that drive our actions. Actions are creating our results. And habits are merely repetitive, well-worn pathways within our brain um, that have been developed over many, many years um, and, um, and um, by our external circumstances and by our culture and by what we've heard from all kinds of people. And so this is put on a loop for our brains. And our brains like to not work very hard. 
our brains like to take the path most traveled, and our, brain, our brains like, um, like reward and they like safety. So if there is a, um, if there is a network that is well established within our brain, our brain is just going to keep going there again and again and again. But if we can cut it off and we can notice it, um, then we can have a different set of feelings in response and we can have a different set of thoughts that we offer ourselves, followed by a different set of feelings, followed by a different set of actions and different results. So I'll give you the example of how a circumstance does not always cause our thoughts, feelings, and results. You can have the same circumstance for three people, and they will respond to it very differently. So I'm going to give you the example of a 10-minute call with your son on the telephone. Three people have a 10-minute phone call with their son. The first person was all settled in for a long talk with their son, and they were really hoping to really get after it, but we hung up after 10 minutes. And they might have the thought, my son doesn't care about me. My son is too busy for me. Uh, I wish that had been longer. That wasn't enough. And when they have that thought, they might have the feeling of loneliness or despair or rejection. And then when they have those feelings, they might go on to have actions uh, that are in line with that, like, I don't know, buffer those feelings with a glass of wine or the world's largest s'more or watch some TV or some retail therapy, right? And that's the action and then that's the result. Here's a second person. This person's son was um, deployed in the military for a year and they get to have one 10 minute phone conversation with their son. Same 10 minute phone call. Their thought after that is, oh my God, that was so amazing. I appreciate that so much. I absolutely cannot believe I got to have that 10-minute phone call. And then when they say that to themselves, they offer themselves that thought, their feelings are one of gratitude and love and excitement. And maybe the actions that flow from that are, I want to go make a care package and send it off to my son or connect with another person whose son is also deployed and that fuels connection. So same phone call, different result. And then you might also have a neutral one, somebody who said, I knew it was going to be a 10-minute phone call. It was a 10-minute phone call. It was OK. Their thought is, that's what I expected. Their feeling is, I don't know, their feeling's neutral. I'm, I got to get back to work. <laughs> I can't be on the phone all day. And, uh, and their action that results from that is whatever else was going to happen for them today, that day. So when we offer ourselves a thought in response to a circumstance, it is fueling what we're actually experiencing, what we're feeling, and then our results. So the question here is, what story are you telling yourself? What's your story? Elsley Library. <laughs> Shout out to the Elsley Library. Um, so what's your story? What story are you telling yourself? And what are you making it mean? And if you're telling yourself a negative story, can we shift it just a little bit? Can we move it towards neutral? Not always to say it could be positive, but can we take it out of the all-time negative failure and into the, I'm working towards becoming someone who might be able to do this better. I'm someone who shows up. I not, might not always do all of it well all the time. So what story are you telling yourself, and what are you making it mean? And what are practical strategies that can help us here? So the first thing to do when your brain offers you uh, a negative thought would be to notice it. So nobody likes to hear that they need to have more mindfulness in their lives. Nobody wants to yoga their way out of everything that we do. But unfortunately, the sad truth is that we have to notice it if we're going to respond to it. So <laughs> when my kids were little, we used to read them this book. And it was called, How Are You Peeling? Foods with Moods. <laughs> Um, and it has all these awesome pictures. You should check it out at the library here. It has all these awesome pictures of foods that are showing emotions. But it's great because it details for us to really try to examine what are the emotions I'm actually, you could be feeling. It's not just happy, sad, mad, angry, right? There's everything in between. So this book is great and everybody should check it out. <clears throat> so we got to notice it 
and we got to recognize it. And James Clear, who is the guru of habits, would tell us that if we're going to have the habit and change a habit, we need to make it obvious. We need to make it attractive. We need to make it easy, and we need to make it satisfying. So the first practical strategy that I'll offer you today is an app that you can put on your phone, which will remind you that you need to notice your feelings. And it's called How We Feel. So this is an app which was created uh, by the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. It's evidence-based. It teaches us emotional regulation and cues that make you pause and pay attention to what's going on with you right now. And another thing that James Clear will tell you is that if you want to change a habit, you have to know the who, what, when, where, and why of what's going on when you feel something that's then going to make you have that action. And I told you that perfectionism and imposter phenomenon, these are all just habits. These are all just patterns we've gotten ourselves into. So we can try this app. You can set it to come up on your phone at irregular times, or you can set it at different times of the day. It shows up. It says, how are you feeling? You click on it, and it has all these different emotions. And you click on one of them, and then it'll say, huh, what were you doing when you started feeling this way? Who's around you? What's going on with you? So this is the same idea. What are the thoughts you're offering yourself that are making you feel this way? So my first uh, plug for you, and by the way, it's free, and I told you I don't have any financial, uh, <laughs> any financial benefit from this, is I really think you should all download this app if you have a phone and you want to use it. Um, I learned about it in one of my uh, leadership classes that I was taking this fall at the University of Vermont Medical Center with a bunch of the leaders uh, from different departments um, at UVM and we're all using it and we text each other sometimes and we say we're using it because it really works. It's great. It just raises our awareness. Um, the second thing that I'll offer you that you can offer yourself is self-compassion rather than harsh criticism. Kristen Neff is a psychologist who has studied the impacts of self-compassion uh, on, pe on people and on how they feel and on their outcomes. And she teaches us that there's three parts to self-compassion. The first part is mindfulness. <laughs> Sorry, once again, you have to really notice when you're having a negative reaction. You can't keep pushing it away. You actually have to notice it and sometimes lean into it. And then when you do, you could approach yourself with kind self-talk. So she says, we need to consider our own needs. We need to talk to ourselves the way we would talk to a really good friend or to one of our children or to your mother. We don't do this very often. We're not very good at this. We talk to ourselves in ways we would never talk to other people. We say, you're such a loser. I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you said that. And we ruminate and we go on and on and on. Kristen Neff teaches us that we should actually be kind to ourselves and we shouldn't be embarrassed about running a dialogue of self-talk in our heads, which is kind of awkward, but you should try it. Um, <laughs> boy, this must be so hard what you're dealing with. I can't even imagine how disappointing it must have been when this happened, right? Um, she also teaches th about um, the impact of touch and that your brain doesn't know the difference between somebody giving you a hug and, I don't want to rub this microphone, but you just giving yourself a pat on your shoulder or touching your arm. Our brain doesn't know the difference. <laughs> which is surprising, right? It doesn't. They've, they've studied this in fMRIs uh, about the power of touch and how we can regulate our own emotions and create the same um, outcomes by doing that ourselves. And then I want to tell you something about this. I actually taught my residents this trick when I went to um, a workshop by, that Kristen Neff gave for doctors because doctors always think we should be perfect and we're always berating ourselves. And she said, let's just try this exercise. You can hold your own hand. No matter where you are, you can hold your hand like this. So when we're t talking to patients, we try not to stand like this or like this. But we can stand like this or we can stand like this. And we can just notice. You could just hold your hand and you could say to yourself in your brain, wow, this is a really challenging interaction. 
and you could take five deep breaths. Self-compassion in, compassion for others out. Five times. And I've tried it, and I've taught it to my residents, and it works. So I challenge you all to try this too. But the third part about Kristen Neff is the idea of common humanity. We all make mistakes. We all learn from our mistakes. But we have to acknowledge that to ourselves, sometimes out loud, in order to start to heal. So there's some myths about the ideas of self-compassion. They say it might create weakness or complacency or narcissism or selfishness. What the research shows us, what the evidence tells us, is that people who practice self-compassion produce less brooding, less rumination. They have higher resilience. They have higher coping skills, higher emotional intelligence. They have stronger personal accountability. They're not, they're not lazy sitting around doing nothing. Actually, they do more. And they have more connection with others as a result of caring more for themselves, which isn't really that surprising, uh, but it's true. So it fuels connection to actually be kind to yourself. There's one more thing you can think about when you're trying to be kind to yourself and think about um, self-compassion. And this is an evidence-based strategy, which again is slightly awkward, but you should try it, which is instead of talking to yourself in the first person, you can try self-talk in the third person. And that looks like, instead of saying, I can't believe how tired I am, you could say, wow, Naomi's really tired. It works well when you're trying to uh, push towards the end of a goal. And, uh, I was hoping that Sue would be here today. She's one of our workout coaches, and she makes us do a lot of burpees when we're working out in the gym. And sometimes, I must admit that I think I cannot do even one more burpee, although she'll tell you that I'm the best burpeer around. Is it true? Yes. Fastest, not best. Ah, fastest. Um, but um, sometimes I say, Naomi can do 10 more burpees. EJ can do 10 more burpees. Our cats group can do 10 more burpees. And when you think that, if you watch that in fMRIs, you see that people have more emotional regulation. It shifts your perspective away from yourself and it makes you, it easier to manage emotions without additional cognitive load. And they monitor, um, they've monitored this um, in imaging studies and they found that when they showed people really disturbing negative images and, um, and they used this technique that they had uh, lower, uh, lower levels of stress response when they used the third person technique. Something to think about, something to try. You don't have to say it out loud, you could just say it in your head. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think this is really important and I'm obviously incredibly passionate about helping those people that I work with, people within my circle, try to overcome some of these. But part of the reason why I feel so strongly about this is my own personal experience with perfectionism and imposter syndrome. So the picture over there on the right is me when I was very, very pregnant with my oldest son, Henry. And I was in Philadelphia. And um, when I was in my fourth year of medical school, uh, we decided to start a family. and. Um, we had him, and he was awesome. And then, uh, at the end of my fourth year of medical school, when all of my best friends were receiving their letters for where they were gonna go for their residency the next year, I was uh, symbolically holding my son, Henry, because I wasn't going to residency the next year because I took some time off to take care of him. And as I have progressed through my education and my training, I have struggled quite a bit with these limiting beliefs and this negative self-talk. Um, but through this work and through reading and learning and some of the work of Kristen Neff, I've gotten better at it. And ironically, when I was preparing this very talk about perfectionism, <laughs> the story my brain wanted to tell me was that nobody would want to come and listen to me. I'm not even an expert. They probably hate it. Probably no one would show up. <laughs> probably my voice would fail. It did. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and so I still hear those voices, but what I'm better at now is actually noticing them. I noticed it, and I said, brain, you're sneaky, but I'm smarter. 
So maybe I'll just move the thought a little bit more to the positive. Maybe it won't be perfect. Maybe one person will learn one thing tonight and maybe they'll take that message to somebody who needs it, right? And by telling myself a believable thought, I actually was able to get over the hump of my over preparation um, and procrastination and get ready to prepare this dang talk that I gave tonight. <laughs> so um, I'll also say that my family and my uh, have been incredibly supportive and my community in general, which has helped me overcome some of these limiting beliefs and some of this imposter phenomenon. So the next time any of you have something really hard that you need to do and your brain is offering you all kinds of messages, uh, those well-worn pathways, I'm going to invite you to borrow my favorite quote uh, from Nelson Mandela. And that is, I never lose. I either win or I learn. Except for I hope that when you say it to yourself, you'll say, Naomi never loses. Naomi either wins or she learns. And I hope that by adopting this growth mindset, uh, we can start to heal and we can help others do the same. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll take any questions. Oh. <laughs> World's greatest exercise. Very hard. <laughs> I can share my slides if anybody has any questions or wants to um, take note of any of, especially the app. It's a really great one. Um, that's such a great question. Um, <laughs> um, you know, as I was going through uh, the end of medical school and my training in my early career, um, I spent a lot of time thinking uh, about not being enough. And when I was at work, I would worry that I should be at home. And when I was at home, I would worry that I should be at work. And I think this is very common among working parents. Um, I wasn't always at the 10 a.m. You know, Cornwall School show. Um, but I will tell you, honestly, the thing that's helped me the most overcome that feeling of not enoughness as a parent has come from my children. Um, I always worried that they were going to say, why do you have to go to work? Why aren't you ever here? Honestly, they talked about actually how much they admired me for doing that and how they thought it was important that I went to work. Um, and, uh, I think they miss me sometimes, but I think hearing that from other people can really fuel the feeling of forgiveness within yourself. That is a great question. And that is um, something we talk a lot about within my colleagues and my former colleagues, um, that uh, the top box score. The only thing that counts is the top box score. Um, and basically, our mantra is you can never win. You know, um, You can't make everybody happy. Maybe you want to do your best as the doctor, but it doesn't always make people feel satisfied or it's not always the answer they want. So they will take it out on you with this survey. Um, and so that's a great question. Sometimes though, we really do look at the narrative comments that come on those surveys. So that's called uh, Prescani scores or the HCAP survey that you might all get. And I'll be honest with you that we do care about the top box score. But we also, on my floor at the, at the medical center, when we're thinking about patient experience and patient satisfaction and provider experience, we actually spend a lot of time looking at uh, the qualitative comments, what people have said, what can we learn from that, how can we change ourselves. So I think 
even though the survey is not designed to be, it can be approached with a growth mindset to see how we can change in the process. Aren't those surveys sort of skewed based on the patients? They can be. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, they absolutely can be. Um, we probably need a better way to understand whether we're doing a good job as a doctor or as a provider of any kind or as an office or as a nurse or as a social worker, anyone. Yeah, and we've talked a lot about how, can, how we can deal with this internally, but we all know there are external factors that are really a big deal in forming the way that we feel about ourselves. And I'm wondering about, I mean, you're in medical school, working with medical school. So in medical school, what's being done to try to get rid of these implicit biases that are working <coughs> against women and minorities? So there's actually a lot of work that's going. Oh, I'm so sorry. The question is, um, what initiatives are being taken to address implicit bias and these expectations of perfection within um, our medical systems? Yeah. Um, so actually, there's a lot of work going on um, on this very topic. Um, so we are studying the patient level factors. We are studying provider level factors. Um, we are working to understand where people feel safe or feel heard and understood in terms of our students, in terms of creating a non-toxic atmosphere, a working environment. You might have heard that the work hour restrictions were changed uh, about uh, some time ago, but it used to be that when you were a resident, you could work as many hours as you wanted and we actually would work multiple 24-hour days in a row. And um, there's a lot more um, looking to wellness of all the people who are involved in the medical system right now. Have we fixed it? Absolutely not. That study shows us we think we're being so aware of this. We don't even know we're doing it. And I didn't tell you that those evaluators were both men and women who were writing those things about the men and the women. And those are pervasive attitudes we have. They live within us, and it's, it's hard to overcome them. Uh, we have to try. Um, we have a lot more work to do. Thanks. Um, what good or bad is a parent doing when they're perpetually praising the child? Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, what good or bad is a parent or a grandparent doing when they perpetually praise their child? Um, I have learned and heard that what we should be praising is the effort, not the outcome, right? It's not how beautiful that picture is. Wow, you worked really hard on that picture. You put a lot of colors in there. Tell me what you were thinking about. So from my understanding, um, looking at uh, looking at the process rather than looking at the outcome at all levels is probably the best way to achieve results. I was just thinking in terms of creating perfectionist people. Absolutely, absolutely, right? And resilient people and people with grit. So I think uh, we know uh, from Angela Duckworth's studies that just achieving 100% on a test does not fuel uh, the next level of hard work um, in learners uh, at all ages. Really, what fuels that is, is, is understanding the process and uh, having a growth mentality rather than a fixed mentality. What? <laughs> but I'm seeing it at the high school level and, and, and even middle school level where kids are under such stress mm. and the mental health amongst young kids today is just unbelievable. As a society, we, this sounds great, but the pressure's always there. The pressure's on. And it is. It's hard for parents to... Well... Um, I agree. <laughs> I don't know that I, uh, 
I don't know that I have an answer for that because, uh, you know, it's always that the, the once then mentality. Once I get into the school, then I'll, be, then I'll be better. Once I get into medical school, once I get into this, it's always that next thing around the corner. So it, it's hard to know uh, how you ever stop the cycle. Somebody had something to say. appreciate that you're there to learn it's not to get the grade it's to learn the experience because that is what you need to get the grade and it's a really really bad cycle one thing I'll add, I, I should have said about um, the idea of medical school and medical culture and our medical education is that actually almost all of medical school at this point has gone to a pass fail method and um, I don't know if uh, there's very few actual grades that they get the converse of that, however, is that it's still the same number of people competing to get into those spots in residency. It's very hard to set yourself apart when everybody has the same grades. How do you do it? So what do they do? So everybody has a pass in every grade. What do you do? You have to start striving super early to get into the research lab so that I can get the paper, so that I can then set myself apart, or also starting a foundation, or maybe saving the world. I don't know. but. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's a, it's a great effort. It's hard. So not only is medical school pass fail, but the first part of the boards that you take as a medical student are now also pass fail. So they've eliminated those scores as well. So it's very, very hard to understand the difference between students. Now, some people would say, why do we have to? If we're preparing them all equally to be excellent, name your poison, social workers, physicians, nurses, whatever, you shouldn't have to have a differentiator, but there always will be a differentiator. <laughs> I think, can we kind of help a little bit along the expectations of parents? And maybe there can be the buffer that do the best you can. And pretty easily help. It, I, I appreciate everything from the black book to the black book. Keeping some balance to it. So the comment was, um, how do we keep balance as parents? First, take your own pulse. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate the discussion.